So let's start right away and maybe with you, Anders. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, delighted to be here today. Um, let me just look back. Somebody was asking whether we are better prepared today uh, than what we were in the past. In 2006, I was the acting director general then for the World Health Organization. I was at the G8 meeting in St. Petersburg. No one knew, of course, who I was, uh, but President Bush took me to the Chinese president during the coffee break and told him, you better tell this man, the health man, if you have an outbreak of a disease. This was in 2006. Are we more prepared, better prepared today? The panel, the previous panel came out with a one-year report called Transforming or Tinkering, and the answering was that the world is still tinkering. I would like to say a few words about the lessons, uh, what we have learned in, in terms of governance in different dimensions, global governance, regional governance, governance across sectors and across both private and public partners. Then a few words, as Michelle said, about the regionalization and what that means in terms of what we still need to do at the global level. And then finally, a few words, as again Michelle was indicating, what is happening right now in terms of global processes and how can we collectively make sure that those are successful and more successful than in the past. So if we look back at the lessons to start with, uh, again, as Michelle and the previous panel was saying, the world was warned. And the way that we had to measure whether the world was prepared did not work. If we look at the graph, countries with the highest scores did the worst, had the highest numbers of deaths. So the way that the world had listened to previous reports, suggestions, we reviewed 16 previous com commissions and panels, and the recommendations had been made, but the world had not taken action. First lesson, this time we need to take action. Second was, and again, as was indicated here before, that the international alarm system, the surveillance system, did not work effectively enough. China reported 48 hours after the, when they should have reported. The, according to the international regulation, it should be done in 24 hours, so 48 instead of 24. But that was not a big problem. The big problem was then three weeks later, when WHO's Director General had the advisory committee to come in and to advise, they did not agree. It took another week before the Director General said, here we have a public health emergence of international concern, 30th of January. But now we have the big problem. The world did not understand what that meant. So the international alarm system did not work. 30th of January. Then we lost another six weeks before he used the word pandemic on the 10th of, May, oh, 10th of March. Then the world reacts. And at that time, we had lost basically uh, and most importantly, the whole month of February. So the international system is not about just alarming and empowering WHO to do that, but it's the way that the international, we basically understand what that alarm system means. Third, uh, we did 28 country studies, looking at some of the best countries and some of the worst countries. And I'm not going to go into this. This is published in international literature. Uh, but this is about governance, and if we looked at some of the best performing countries, we spoke about four Cs, and that had to do with good governance. At the national level, in between different ministries, but also working across private and public, working with communities. I would say South Korea was possibly one of the best examples of having an early aggressive containment strategy. And then you had governments where we classified them as the four Ds, that they evaluated, uh, created distrust among people, uh, and I don't think I need to name the countries that did the worst, that basically devaluated the whole, uh, the whole challenge. The fourth lesson was, again, what has been discussed here, <coughs> that was about diagnostics and vaccines, and uh, the genetic sequence was chaired then on the 10th of January, rep it's never been done so quickly before it was published in, in the International Journal. And we have not have a vaccine being developed so quickly, but not just one, but a number of vaccines. So that was a big success, so a lot of lessons. But the big failure was, of course, the access to the vaccines. And not just from an equity perspective, but for, from an effective public health perspective. Did we use the vaccines and diagnostic in the most effective way to stop the pandemic as quickly as possible? The simple answer is no. Next time we need to do better, not just get the vaccines, the volumes, but using them in a more effective way to be able to stop the pandemic quicker. So those are some of the lessons. Second, 
dimension to this is also what has happened here is that we have a much stronger regionalization, I would say politically generally, but also of health. When I was the head of the WHO country office during the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, the African CDC did not exist when I left in 2017. Today, it's a power. <coughs> the African Union, what we have seen happening here during just the last years, is a totally different situation. As Michel said, from the European side, the European Commission presented now a new strategy for global health. I was there in Brussels, and when Sweden takes on the presidency for the European Union or the European Council next year, we will also ensure that there is political support uh, for a new strategy, a new direction for global health. But with stronger regions, and it's not just in Africa and Europe, it's also here in the Middle East, it's in Asia, what does it mean in terms of global? actions, global responsibilities, because that agenda needs to change. I don't think we need a global platform for vaccines in the future, but we need stronger regional platforms, but we still need global cooperation, sharing information, data, but also ways of working the management, the flow of then access to products. So we need to rethink the global functions based on that we have stronger regions today. Are we ready? No, we are not ready, as I said. And uh, Michelle, you were saying that there are two major sort of processes happening now. One set of processes in Geneva, a new treaty, and in New York, a potential then political agreement. Both of those are extremely difficult and cumbersome. It's going too slow. The political environment right now is not the best. We need all support from you, from people across the world, from both private and public saying that we need certain political decisions, we need certain rules. We need to empower WHO to share information quickly. We need ways of engaging across private and public to be able to have access to resources and tools more rapidly in the future. So we need both the rules that are basically negotiated in Geneva, and we need also the political commitment that is our hope that we will have from this meeting in New York. Two critical things to this, those agendas. One is about this platform for access to what we call the medical countermeasures, the vaccines, the diagnostics, etc., and then the financing of that. And the second one is then the suggestion from the panel of, of also establishing some sort of platform with senior leaders from both potentially both private and public to be able to be the sounding board to problem solve if something like this is happening so we don't have the very bad situation when we had at the beginning of the pandemic when the US and China couldn't agree on anything basically. So the need for a platform where we can work across regions and sectors. Let me finish Jan, just, by, by, just to say that this pandemic is still not just about the virus. It's not only about getting the vaccines. This pandemic, as again Michelle was saying initially, has been about economies. It's been people losing their jobs. It's been about children not having access to school. And we have not seen the impact of this yet. So for the future, we need to think about that we have countries, systems, commitments at all levels national, regional, globally, that is not only focusing on making sure we get the vaccines, but that we have national system, international system, that can also deal with those broader challenges, because that is what we've seen. And I can't help saying then something at the end that might be a bit surprising, because somebody was mentioning nutrition. Uh, one of the critical factors, whether you were successful or whether you had um, a number of, you lost a number of lives, was actually the rate of obesity. If you look at the US, the most important factor whether you were at high risk was obesity. So if you speak now about climate and what we need to do in terms of changing our food system, it's about climate, but it's also about health. And the biggest epidemic we have in the world today is actually obesity. And that is all in some way should trigger thinking that this is more than just a virus. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, excellent. So let's um, thank you, Anders, for setting the scene.